as you might have been informed, we will have three panels today. But the first one is a general insight to the actual political instability or stability questions in the Western Balkans and uh, the European integration process of the region. Uh, reflecting on the consequences and impacts of the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis and the inflation, the migration uh, uh, pressure, and so on and so forth. So thank you very much for coming and being interested in our program. So much, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manu. So dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have to stand here so you can see me uh, from a perspective and also our distinguished guests. So let me welcome, uh, let me warmly welcome you at the first panel uh, today's event entitled Stability and EU Integration Issues in the Western Balkan Region. My name is Sobos Chunik, I'm a researcher uh, at the Center for Political Science here at MCC. And I have the honor, I have the honor to moderate this discussion. Unfortunately, as all you can see for technical reasons, we have no uh, panelists here in person today, but we will do our best that they will join us online. And we have three uh, you know, experts on board. We send out a expert of the Institute for Development and International Relations, Zagreb. Mr. Radko Petrovic, researcher of the Institute of European Studies. And last but not least, Mr. Ferenc Neyman, researcher of the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And now we will start. And I also encourage you to ask questions at the end of our discussion, just as Balin did. And if you don't mind, I would sit from now on. So, dear colleagues, my first question uh, would sound as follows. How has the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war impacted the stability of the Western Balkan region, including the war's economic and energy implications? Thank you very much. At first, I want to say that it is a great pleasure to be here today with you and to have the opportunity to share points of view with, uh, with you uh, regarding those issues. Well, I think that first of all uh, those four questions is definitely the most important one, because the war in Ukraine, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and conflict between uh, Russia and the West in general, is the very important issue, at least here in my country, in Serbia. Uh, you know that uh, many newspapers, uh, websites, uh, televisions, uh, not only in our region, but also worldwide, especially in the Western countries are speaking a lot or uh, writing a lot about uh, the possibility of spreading this conflict among other regions of Europe and world. And of course, unfortunately, the Western Balkans is uh, just simply targeted as a potential unstable uh, part of the Europe regarding those issues in Ukraine. Uh, definitely the, the most important thing is the fact that Serbia is the only country which is part of the EU integration process, which didn't uh, impose any kind of sanctions against Russia. And it is uh, something that is provoking a political instability because the European Union has a clear concept that Serbia should um, make, as they say, harmonization uh, uh, of its foreign uh, policy and security policy with the one which is the official one of the European Union institutions. Uh, the inflation is already present uh, here in Serbia. Uh, I uh, read yesterday, this morning, that it is now around 14%, but believe me, people are uh, feeling it uh, very hard um, today, and we expect that it is going to grow in the future. Um, definitely, uh, Serbia is in the focus uh, of the whole world and Europe, if we speak about uh, the position of the uh, Western Balkans as a region regarding the Ukrainian crisis, because uh, we are the country which should decide whether we would uh, continue to have a good mm -hmm. relations with Russia, especially if we speak about 
uh, our energetic cooperation or we are going to decide definitely that we want to belong to the uh, Western uh, political uh, alliance and the Western civilization in general. Um, the status quo in the Balkans, well, uh, day by day, it is uh, affected, uh, and it can be affected a lot in the future because, you know, uh, in the context of all those things happening in Ukraine, now you have uh, an open claims by, for example, Germany, France, some other countries asking from Serbia to um, recognize so-called Kosovo as an independent state, uh, we already have uh, the political instability in the Bosnia Herzegovina regarding uh, previous elections, presidential elections in Republic of Srpska entity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I will stop now and I will give the floor to my other colleagues. And of course, you can ask me any question about this. I see that Ferenc is still muted, so it's probably time for me. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and. Uh... I'm happy to, to be in this virtual um, dialogue with uh, other panelists, but also with you as the audience. Um, uh, also a few remarks uh, from me at the beginning. Uh, certainly the uh, Russian aggression on Ukraine on 24th of February is the game changer in, in Europe. And uh, as much as uh, we may not feel fully the consequences of this uh, war. I think we need to grasp the fact that we have war in Europe and that this war, at least from the Croatian perspective, um, is um, there is a hope, but there is not too much expectation, but there is a hope that uh, if this war can, which started in Ukraine, if it can end in Ukraine, would be beneficial for the whole continent, but it is not clear if this is going to be the case. So different scenarios are basically considered and there are also different actors who play with, this, with these different possible outcomes. Uh, one thing that we need to understand is that Putin's regime is not fighting Ukraine, he's fighting the West or the regime is fighting the West. So basically, if we are on the side of Ukraine, we are against, uh, fully against Russia. And I think this is something that also here in Croatia is not, politically, is not fully aligned, I have to say. We have, we have um, official statements which downplay our support to Ukraine and do not want to get involved. And uh, if I can understand it from the political perspective, um, from the perspective of us being part of NATO and the EU, if we expect the solidarity and protection from NATO and the European Union, I feel that we need also to show responsibility as a member. And our position still is that we are very small and that we are marginal and therefore we don't need to be the one who decides on anything or even that we can stay basically invisible in this whole conflict. And um, I'm not very optimistic that this is going to be possible. With respect, so this is in, on broader European issues. Uh, and one more thing regarding Europe. I think we need to understand that uh, this current conflict and this war in Ukraine is going at this pace because of the US engagement. If we were left on our own, if we as Europeans were to provide support for Ukraine, I don't think we would be where we are. But I think we need to understand that the United States fundamentally is shifting its focus, the strategic, political and security focus on Asia, or to be more precise on China and Far East. And we are going to be left on our own. And in that sense, I think we need to develop understanding that and responsibility for all, our own security, uh, take response. I mean, um, be um, <laughs> fully uh, realistic in what we are facing, and um, use our resources better. 
I think the European Union is still acting uh, as if everything is as it was before the Feb February 24th, that we can basically, despite the small um, uh, hurdle of the war in Ukraine, that we can expect that things will go back uh, to normal uh, soon, which I don't think is going to be possible. And in that sense, I would expect more uh, responsible and more you know, uh, forceful uh, European leadership, because the United States is not going to be here to provide for our security for very long. And this brings us to the Balkans, where the Russian aggression on Ukraine is felt in this region. In Serbia, that Reiko mentioned, in Republika Srpska, partially in Montenegro and in North Macedonia, I would say. And uh, depending on the outcome of the war in Ukraine, this will also reflect on the balance of forces in the Western Balkans. If Putin is defeated, this will be, obviously, this will diminish strength or uh, threats by Milorad Dodik in Republika Srpska, secessionist threats. This will probably also, you know, put Serbia in a different perspective because geographically, I think, I mean, Serbia cannot belong anywhere else than within the European community of nations. Uh, and uh, for all, um, um, if you look at all indicators in terms of trade, FDI, investments, uh, grants, uh, and people's mobility, Serbia is fully integrated with Europe, but it still wants to play this role of several angles of its foreign policy. And uh, I don't think it is going to be possible in the world that is developing. I think we are going, getting into more polarized, more confrontational world than we have been uh, so far. So this is uh, from, from me for the beginning and, uh, and then we definitely can continue with your questions. Thank you very much for your general assessment of the situation. And Ferenc, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I apologize that I couldn't join you in person this time. Uh, I usually do talk a lot, especially about the Western Balkans. And since we, ha since we have a lot to discuss, I will try to be as compact as possible so we have enough time to exchange ideas. Um, so the war in Ukraine obviously had a lot of implications on uh, Southeast Europe. Uh, since Raiko discussed the situation on the ground and Senada gave an assessment from a broader global perspective, uh, I thought I would focus more on uh, how the U European Union um, reacted uh, to the war in Ukraine with the focus on the Western Balkans. Um, I pretty much believe that the EU did well in that department uh, in the Western Balkans and has responded well uh, by threatening the capabilities of Euphorata in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the capabilities of the foreign police unit of uh, Eulex uh, uh, in Kosovo. Um, so it showed that the EU could uh, have a proactive approach in times of crisis and uh, it demonstrated it in the first weeks uh, of the war in the Balkans. But other than that, stability-wise, I haven't uh, experienced any major changes in the Western Balkans in the last months. Russia is still present. Uh, I don't see any negative or positive changes uh, on its influence towards certain political actors or uh, the society uh, as such. One thing that I could observe in the last few weeks is that there are a lot of uh, Russian middle-class citizens in Serbia. Belgrade is now filled with uh, Russian uh, young people, younger generations that are involved in the ICT or IT sectors, and that can really be beneficial for the Serbian economy, for the Serbian ITC sectors in the longer run. And speaking about economy and uh, the energy implications of the war in Ukraine, one thing that should be mentioned is that uh, even before February, the region, the Western Balkan region faced a looming economic and energy crisis. Um, we are still not over the negative implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Um, but as for now, I would say most of the countries of the region are in a good path in uh, di diversifying their energy supplies, although this process cannot and will not uh, happen overnight. Um, lastly, I want to draw your attention to two countries, Croatia and Greece, that as far as I could see, it will play a crucial role, a crucial regional role in uh, becoming energy hubs for the entire region as well. Thank you very much um, for your thoughts. My second question would uh, be the following. Besides the consequences of the war, a couple of things you already mentioned, what are the greatest other challenges currently faced by the Western Balkan countries and how are these addressed by the respective governments in the region? You, friends, you already mentioned some of those uh, in your closing uh, sentences, but still, uh, I think it's, it's an interesting question. So please go ahead, whoever wants. So I might start this question, all right. Um, sure. There are a lot of um, structural problems um, that basically all of the countries of the Western Balkans faces these days. Those are not new problems, uh, but as we get older, as the region gets older, uh, one might say those issues are getting more pressing and pressing day by day. Um, be before I talk about the structural problems, I just want to make a quick point about stability because since the 1990s, the EU and the majority of the international community heavily focused on peace and stability in the Balkans, concerning the Balkans. And obviously it's uh, an, a pressing issue. It was a pressing issue in the past and sometimes it's an issue uh, nowadays as well, but I feel like we stuck with the same agenda. Um, so focusing on negative peace, which means that um, focusing on the prevention of an armed conflict is not enough at all in the Western Balkans at this point. What the region needs is so-called positive peace, first and foremost, economic development, economic investments, uh, foreign direct investments to be more precise, resilience and resilient institutions that are able to fully function even in times of a political crisis and uh, nevertheless deep structural reforms that should have taken place decades ago. Two structural problems that I want to highlight would be brain drain and democratic, uh, demographic decline. Uh, in every 30 minutes or so, one citizen from a Western Balkan state gets a residence or work, work permit in uh, one of the EU member states. This impacts mainly the young generation, the generation that speaks multiple languages, highly skilled, and one would think that that generation would be the trigger for internal changes in the Western Balkan countries. Um, so they are leaving the region a mess. Uh, and the other problem is, or let's say the other side of this coin is that uh, the dem demographic decline that the entire region faces. And to be honest, I haven't really seen any initiatives uh, from the sides of the Western Balkan governments that would somehow try to mitigate um, the negative consequences of such problems so far. I can continue on this because I think Ferenc really underlined an important uh, structural problem for the Balkans, which I think also affects Hungary and the whole of Eastern Europe, but probably not at such um, um, extreme, I would say now almost scale that it is uh, in the Balkans, uh, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia Herzegovina, Bosnia and Herzegovina is now the first, um, uh, the top country from which people emigrate. Um, Croatia is also in very poor uh, states. In the course of the last 10 years, we lost almost 10% of the population. This is what the 2021 census uh, showed. Um, and in the, since the, in the last 30 years, almost a million, which is a result of the war, but also um, emigration and then also low birth rates. So what Ferenc said is that how governments are responding uh, basically, they are looking at very conservative methods of trying to either attract diaspora to return, which is not happening, or uh, to incentivize women to have more children or young couples to have more children, which is also not happening. 
uh, and immigration is not considered as, a, as an option in our very conservative societies. And it is very politically um, sensitive uh, issue. Although we don't see much immigration, but still it is very politically sensitive issue. Um, so either we change our policies or we will be faced with demographic decline and the you know empty lands, empty villages and um, our social systems will break and it will be very difficult will be very difficult to sustain our economy. So um, this is something that is now sidelined in discussions because of the pressure of the war and uh, rising you know, energy prices and um, inflation and security and so on. But um, it brings into question all the other issues that, that we want to, to discuss in terms of actors in the Western Balkans the um, the new generation of politicians, if you are going to see them, I mean, if you look at faces or, or names or political parties that are in power in most of these countries, these are the same persons and the same politics uh, for decades, and uh, and this is this is uh, not uh, positive. So the EU despite its presence, has not created this element of political competition and change and, um, you know, capacity for reconciliation, capacity to um, dis detach oneself from the past. We still discuss history as our reality and it's, it's really something that tires people. People don't live only because of economic reasons, people live because of political reasons. People leave because they don't believe in better future. And this is the what is defeating. It's not that you know you get poor or you you your economy crashes, but if you know that you can have better future, then you invest in this better future, you stay and you work. But despite the, because of this depression, uh, in a sense of depressive outlook of one's future, um, this is very, very strong. The old research, I mean all uh, surveys show that this is one of strong reasons why people uh, leave. And this leaves us with this aspect of managing migration, which is something that the EU invests a lot in. And uh, unfortunately, if things are not handled differently, I think Balkans can become really a parking lot for many of migrants, which are not going to be permitted into the European Union, and then Balkans will be forced to host them. And this is going to add additional pressure on the societies that are already not functioning very well. Uh, well, my estimated colleagues already said a, a few structural problems of the Western Balkans in general. Maybe I can add a few concrete problems, which is uh, Serbia facing today, actually. And definitely Serbia is the biggest country in the Western Balkans, the most important one. And the uh, peace, stability, and uh, prosperity of the entire region is impossible without Serbia as a stable part of it. So I think that we today, regarding Ukra Ukrainian crisis, which just simply accelerated uh, problems which we already had, uh, that today Serbia is facing uh, four, uh, uh, sorry, five really structural problems. First one is uh, energetic stability. As you know, uh, for us, Genaf is now canceled. So our government is planning to construct uh, two new pipelines, one in direction of the Hungary and the other one to the North Macedonia and the Resh port. Uh, the other problem for us is the fact that some EU member states think that uh, uh, so-called uh, white Schengen regime for Serbia should be cancelled. So for us, it's a very important issue. And it is connected with the third problem that we have. It's the new uh, migrant crisis. Some experts, experts think that we are going to face again, all of us together, including Hungary uh, and Croatia, a uh, new uh, wave of migrants but now not only from the Middle East region, but also from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, uh, Mr. Ferenc said uh, 
very well and correct that there is a lot of Russians and Ukrainians today in Belgrade. We are actually speaking about 30 or 40 uh, thousand people today in Belgrade from Ukraine and Russia, and uh, they are uh, making good, not uh, some concrete troubles like uh, migrants used to do from the Middle East or Northern Africa with violence, etc. But they are uh, making some kind of economic instability, especially if we speak about renting apartments. It's a big problem for our students. They have to pay. Uh, way more money today to achieve apartment, etc. Uh, the problem number four for us definitely is the Kosovo issue. I already mentioned it. And you know that today, always when uh, every of two or how many sides is involved in this conflict are speaking about Ukraine and the future of the uh, four uh, areas of Ukraine, which were enacted by Russia, they mentioned uh, Kosovo. For example, uh, the representative of Russia in the General Assembly of the United Nations uh, a few days ago, uh, Mr. Nebenzia, uh, again spoke about Kosovo, about double standards and so on. For us, it is the big problem because it is complicating our position. Um, some in some way, we are afraid that Russia is going to accept that model of behavior in international relations, that they will use the case of Kosovo to justify their position in Ukraine. And for us, it is the big problem because Russia used to be our biggest ally in the foreign policy, especially regarding Kosovo issue. And the, the problem number five definitely is uh, the biggest one. It is a deeply uh, structural and strategic problem for us. It is the future course of the Serbian foreign policy. Are we going to be a new Belarus, as some uh, officials from the EU, EU are already uh, speaking about Serbia, or we are going to be the part of the political West? Our population is divided. Uh, uh, the polls, recent polls have shown that uh, below four, uh, around 40% of people in Serbia think that we should be part of the European Union. That's uh, not even half, half of the population. Around 80% of people think that we shouldn't impose any kind of sanctions against Russia. And that's making a very huge pressure on, on our government, which is trying to make some neutral, balanced position. But all great powers, including Russia, are against that position. And it is going to uh, produce a, a very complicated situation in, in Serbia. And definitely, it is going to affect the entire region. And uh, again, if you have some additional questions, we can discuss about it later. Can I ask Raiko a question? Okay. Uh, yes. Um, what do you think should be the Serbian foreign policy orientation? Uh, well, let me say that uh, generally I am a pro-Russian, personally speaking. Uh, from, from the scientific point of view, I think that uh, Russia should... Uh, say openly their intentions and plans for Serbia and Western Balkans in general. If we are the only country which didn't impose sanctions against Russia, we are going to, to feel some consequences because of it. Uh, lack of energy stability, visa regime, as I said, pressures about Kosovo. So I think that Russia has the responsibility to say uh, would they like to help us? And do they have the instruments and the resources to help us? It is, if it is not going to be case, then I definitely think that we should uh, consider the fact that uh, our only option could be to find some new agreement, uh, some new approach uh, regarding our relations with Western countries uh, it is going to be very difficult. You know, we used to have that foreign policy, you know, sitting on the two chairs, 
uh, now it is going to be very unstable because we can we can lose both of those chairs. Um, and it is the price that we have to pay because we uh, used to have benefits from that policy. But many people were speaking, analysts, politicians from both sides, that it can last forever. Now our government is in a, in a big problem about it. First of all, because, you know, for example, maybe I am a, a, a pro-Russian person, pro-Russian citizen of Serbia, but I am a, a scientist and I can analyze some facts. But unfortunately, you have a, a, a very huge percent of people in Serbia who are only emotionally reacting on those issues. You know, they think that Russia is good side, that they are fighting against the evil forces of the West or something like that. And they, even they think... Uh, uh, a very uh, significant part of our population think that we should even suffer uh, just uh, to show that we are against the West and that we are supporting 100% of Russia without any Russian aid. So I think that it is a very a bad uh, position perspective. And unfortunately, I think that the Russians uh, know very well how things are working, working here, that they are playing on that uh, on, on those emotions among Serbian population. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. That would jump to the second half of our panel's title, which uh, addresses EU migration issues in the region. And uh, I would ask uh, the following question. Did the prospect of EU membership have any stabilizing effect in the region in recent years? And if so, how? And second question, maybe in this regard, how do the citizens see the issue of EU accession today, something uh, Raikul already uh, has already touched upon in uh, recent minutes. I can speak obviously on behalf of countries that are not members of the European Union because Croatia is. And we hope that Croatia would be a stabilizing factor um, or positive example of the EU accession. And uh, these, the hopes did not materialize, certainly not to the extent that they Mm, what they were um, almost 10 years ago for different reasons, not only for because of Croatia's mistakes, but also because of general situation in, uh, in, in Europe and elsewhere. I think, I mean, uh, if you want to answer this question whether EU membership, what is it, st has stabilizing effect? Yes, probably it does. Normatively it does because it shows you direction, a path. You will end up in the European Union, which, as we know, still is the richest and you know uh, club of states in the world. But, but how far is this membership really? I mean, is it ever going to materialize? Is a serious question. It took Croatia a decade. Um, how many years it will take to Serb uh, for Serbia, North Macedonia, Albania. I mean, we had a situation where a country changed its name. It went through, through such uh, humiliating, I would say, and very, uh, you know, strong political um, process to change a name in order to be granted um, candidacy and the date of the opening of negotiations, and they didn't get it. Um, I uh, have serious uh, doubts that the enlargement as it is going now can continue for all kinds of reasons, because of the reality that the European Union is facing in the global context, because of the state of you know, um, stability, democratic development and economic um, uh, development in the countries that are acceding to the European Union and because of the state of affairs within the EU Union itself, because we are discussing the um, unanimity of voting, so the qualified majority voting on which we, there is no agreement in the European Union. And many people are linking the internal EU reform with the potential for enlargement. Whether these things should be remain, should remain linked, I I don't know, but certainly they are at the moment. So what we basically are facing is very um, immoral, I would say, almost game of 
the EU promising membership, while in reality, everybody knows that this membership is not at the table anytime soon, for the reasons, as, as I said. So um, the I think what these countries in the Balkans should do is to understand that the EU, whether it is in the form as it is or in a different format, different combination of countries, this is our continent. We are not going to change our geography. We are not going to be in some other part of the world. If it, is, if it has shown that um, the rule of law, that a strong judiciary, that protection of minorities, that uh, investment in, you know, in uh, its own uh, economy in terms of developing um, key uh, strategic industries and protecting our sources of energy supply and blah, blah, blah. If this helps develop our societies, and this is, if this is the recipe that the EU is giving, it doesn't have to come from the EU. It can be our own invention because we do it for the benefit of our own societies. This is something that Raiko touched upon, that's, for example, in the, case, in the case of Serbia, that Serbia felt that it can play different actors. So it can have transactional, take something from one side, take something from the other side. It may be worked while we had peace, but I don't think this is going to be possible. They will have to be, and nobody forces Serbia to, to, to join the EU. I think this is wrong. Sometimes I get the impression that the EU wants Serbia more than Serbia wants the EU. It doesn't work this way. If I have a company, somebody you know, wants to come to, to, to join me, there has to be a strong wish on the other side uh, if we are going to have a partnership relationship. It, it, it cannot be asymmetrical. It doesn't work. Uh, so these threats of potential conflicts, I think the EU should diffuse the possibility that there is any conflict in the Balkans and to relax this idea said, but nobody can blackmail it with the potential of conflict erupting in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Montenegro or anywhere else. That there should be military force which stabilizes this region. The EU has a uh, military capacity to do so. And I think it should take the responsibility. And then we can discuss political and other issues, but security should be taken off from the agenda. I think for us to relax and to know that nobody can you know, invade anyone or that there could be anyone else coming and uh, creating conflict in this region. Um, and I think that would be, the, and this is something that I think the EU has not grasped yet. It's NATO, it's NATO here and there. It's American presence, whether it will remain or not, but we don't have strong European military force, which uh, simply brings, you know, the sense of stability in the Balkans. And for me, this should be the priority. Thank you very I completely, much. I, I completely agree with Sanada because uh, I don't see the EU as, as this stabilizing actor anymore in the Balkans either. It lost a lot of its credibility and normative power uh, exactly because of the things that Sanada elaborated on. And then many times when there is a political crisis, it is not the EU, but the US that chimes in and resolves the problem, which says a lot about the capabilities, or let's say the foreign policy capabilities of the EU uh, at this age. Uh, what I see here is, is, is a real paradox. Because EU enlargement, as we discussed, will not happen anytime soon, unfortunately. On the other hand, full-fledged EU membership is, as far as I'm concerned, is the only option for all the countries of the Western Balkans. No other external power can uh, offer that much of a technical and financial help and assistance as the EU does or the EU can. Uh, even if we look at uh, immigration trends, most of the people emigrate from the region to the EU and not to Russia or China or wherever uh, uh, to other parts of the, uh, to the globe. So it's really a testament that in fact, although citizens are losing hope that one day their country would become uh, full-fledged member states, but they are still want to live their future lives within the EU umbrella. And this is a problem because it will not happen anytime soon. They are losing credibility. The accession, the EU accession process is in crisis, at least for a decade now. But still, there is no 
other alternative that would be as beneficial as EU membership for the entire region and for the EU as well. Uh, I can add just one more thing. It's the project called European Political Community launched by Emmanuel Macron. And the people in Serbia are asking themselves now, uh, what's uh, going on with that project? Does that mean that uh, European Union uh, is not going to receive new state members for some while, or it means that it is just some kind of broader project, including European integrations. We also are very interested in our mini project called Mini Schengen. It's some kind of economic cooperation with Northern Macedonia, Albania, and we would like to spread it on Bosnia, Herzegovina and Montenegro. So definitely, I think that European Union at this point has and that it will have a positive uh, stabilizing uh, initiatives here in, in this region. Thank you very much for all of you. And uh, I think we can have one very short question from the audience. Please feel free to address any, any of our panelists or maybe all of them who will have uh, one minute to answer to that question, if there is any. Hi, I'd like to just uh, give a um, big right to my to the, the last uh, sentence that you mentioned about Min Schengen uh, and the area of uh, free movement on the Western Balkans. Uh, do you see this happening parallel to uh, the uh, accession process of Albania and North Macedonia, or uh, say some kind of an alternative? And uh, insofar, do you see this as a process which will bring uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, and Serbia closer to European integration together with uh, Albania and North? Yes, I think that it is a parallel process to the EU integration process. And uh, our government and government of Albania and Northern Macedonia have said it clearly. Uh, uh, our governments do not see it as alternative to the EU uh, integrations, we see it just some kind of a uh, uh, step to, to improve our qualities, to improve the level of cooperation, uh, uh, um, exchange, etc. And uh, definitely it can be only beneficial. Some people, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina, from the Bosniak side, they see it as uh, uh, some kind of new greater Serbia project or something like that. But it is not true because in that economic community, if I can call it in that way, you would have a lot of people with different uh, ethnicities, religions, etc. It wouldn't be some kind of Serbian world. It is just uh, some good regional initiative uh, which is sending a message to the European Union that maybe we are trying to do something on our own to show that we have a capacity to become one day a full uh, members of the European Union. That's my perspective. And thank you for uh, the contribution of all of you. Uh, the first panel is over with this. I, I encourage the colleagues online to, to stay with us for the rest of the event. And uh, let me ask uh, some patience from you for a couple of minutes. We will have to rearrange the scene for the second panel, and then the event continues. Thank you very much. Dear guests, uh, now we jump into the deep waters of Bosnia and Herzegovina politics. Uh, thank you very much for remaining with us. And I uh, give the floors uh, to our distinguished guests from the University of Sarajevo and Al Jazeera Balkans. And uh, the roundtable discussion will be moderated by Ben Zakertis, a student of the Matthias Corbin's College and International Relations School. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all and the workshop about the political stability in the Balkans. This panel is going to focus on the effects of the latest election in Bosnia and Herzegovina analyzing the challenges and revealing future perspectives on the political stability of the region. It is an honor for me that I can introduce our panelists, Mr. Yasmin Hasanovic, who is 
a senior teaching assistant at the Department for Political Science of the University of Sarajevo. Mr. Osman Susic, senior teaching assistant at the Department for Political Science of the University of Sarajevo. And last but, last but not least, Mr. Harun Karcic, uh, who is political analyst, uh, executive, executive producer at Current Affairs, Al Jazeera World News. Dear speakers, thank you for accepting our invitation. First, let us focus on the world's most complex election system that characterizes Bosnia Herzegovinian politics. Voters have to decide on the composition of the collective state presidency, the representatives of the lower house of the country's federal parliament, the MPs of the parliaments of the Serb and Bosnia court dominated sub state entities, and thus the 10 cantonal assemblies of the latter entity. Mr. Hasanovic, how do you see that this complex system guarantees stability or the framework itself predetermine political chaos? Uh, thank you a lot, and thank you for <coughs> being here uh, on this panel. Uh, yeah, it is a complex political system, it's a complex political situation as well. And currently, as we are here speaking, uh, in fact, we are still missing the official results from the elections that we had almost three weeks ago because of different accusations of irregularities that were happening during the, during the uh, <clears throat> counting of the ballots. So maybe to relax the situation a little bit, <laughs> I will uh, tell a joke. I saw this morning on, on social media, uh, there is a claim that in healthy and happy uh, countries, the people don't care too much about politics and they don't know who the president is. And the same is happening in Republika Srpska, but not because they are happy, but because two, opposite, two opposing parties are arguing who is the winner of the elections and which, uh, who is the president in, in Republika Srpska. So, um, yeah. The, the political system of the country is complex. Um, we have a kind of multi-level government, uh, governance. We have uh, power sharing among different ethnic groups. And I would call it uh, consociational, but not democracy, but <laughs> ethnocracy, because the ethnical is the main political subject in, in our political system. The second problem is the sovereignty of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, we are a sovereign country regarding of international relations, but when it comes to the inner sovereignty, uh, first we have the sovereignty divided between different levels of authorities, whether a central authority, federal or uh, entity, and so on, but also uh, as our constitution is a part of the Dayton Peace Agreement, which ended the war in Bosnia, one part of the Dayton Peace Agreement is the current constitution of the country. And the current constitution of the country, uh, fun fact, the official language of our constitution is not <laughs> Bosnian or Serbian or Croat, it's English, because it's written in Dayton, Ohio, in United States. And uh, because our political system is a part of a peace agreement, even we have the international community that is <coughs> institutionalized in our political system. We have the Office, for high, office of High Representative who is in uh, care of um, the civic implementation of the peace agreement. So we have a kind of limited, but also divided sovereignty. Um, now, the functionality, uh, it's always a political and I would say a theoretical or a methodol methodological question uh, how we measure functionality. Uh, but what I see currently in Bosnia Herzegovina is that we are having uh, electoral procedure. <coughs> so the elections, the competitive elections are not a uh, problem, but still. Uh, the irregularities are showing to us that the power is not in the votes, but on those who are voting. Uh, sorry, not, uh, not by those who are voting, but those who are counting the votes, which uh, tells me that we are running not only 
a democratic backsliding, not only towards illiberalism, but also uh, having uh, a captured deep state, which is uh, making problems in, in, in any world. Um, and last, uh, what, what, what also can be a problem is the, of course, clientelism. If you have deep state, you have clientelism, you have um, different, different levels of um, eroding accountabilities, check and balances, and so on. Um, but what is interesting in Bosnia and Herzegovina is that unlike the European uh, authoritarian regimes and illiberal regimes, our political um, system, I wouldn't say that Bosnia is an illiberal state because the central, uh, the central government is very weak. The most sovereign powers are on lower uh, levels of authorities, like the entities or even the cantons in Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which means that we are having a kind of illiberalism but, or authoritarianism, but not on the state level, but on the level or et on ethnical groups or on uh, 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 subnational sub -national institutions. And the second problem regarding the question of functionality is the problem that we don't have an agreement of course, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a sovereign country, but in, in the country we don't have an agreement, is Bosnia a Herzegovina country or not? Because you have the Serb dominant politics that is claiming that Bosnia and Herzegovina is, a, let's say, a union of states or uh, just some kind of, 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 I don't know, commonwealth in which Republika Srpska is a state. Uh, denying the, the existence of the country. Uh, on the other side, dominant Croat politics, they don't deny the country, but they are favoring more federalism in order to have uh, another federal unit that will be based upon ethnical, uh, ethnical identity. And finally, the Bosnians that are, uh, they are numerically the, they make the, the most of the population, but not territorially. Um, they see Bosnia and Herzegovina as, as, as one country, which um, they're also favoring uh, strengthening of central institutions. Uh, and that's a practice that Croats and, and Serbs, I mean, their official politics, sees as the case of the, the Bosniaks want to dominate over them, but on the other side, uh, the Croat and the Serb official politics in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, are threatening to Bosniaks to lose their country. And it's a statement, something similar said uh, the Croatian political scientist Dejan Jovic, uh, when he said, yes, we have a problem because the Bosniaks fear that they will lose their country because unlike Croats or Serbs, Bosniaks don't have another country. They don't have another homeland. But on the other side, the problem uh, which is seen by the Serbs and by the Croats is that the, the idea how dominant Bosnia uh, political view is, uh, they fear that they it will be a national Bosniak country where the Bosniaks will dominate over Serbs and Croats. So I think the main problem regarding functionality is ethnopolitics, because when you have ethnopolitics, you cannot think on a country which is multi-ethnical. And Bosnia and Herzegovina is multi-ethnical and it needs to remain multi-ethnical. And I will conclude with this. Thank you for listening to your dance well. Beyond the electoral system, uh, as Mr. Asanovic mentioned, the Dayton Peace Agreement also created a position to oversee the implementation of its provisions. It's called the High Representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And now we have Mr. Christian Schmidt in office. By having vast political powers, we propose to change the electoral law during this year's election. For example, by increasing the number of seats in the parliament, making it possible to choose more black representatives from ten, the 10 cantons of the Bosnia Croat entity. Mr. Sushik, there are, was there any need for such a decision and how does it affect the political environment? Uh, so first, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel. 
regarding your question, first uh, I will have to introduce uh, about the uh, Office of Higher Representative. First, he was uh, appointed last year, in summer of last year, but he, did, he was not recognized in the United Nations because the Russian didn't recognize him. Then also we have the uh, politicians from Republika Srpska, uh, Milorad Dodik, uh, who was a member of the president, uh, who is still a member of the presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and he's also, uh, he doesn't recognize him as a, as a high representative. And the changes that he made uh, about electoral law, he just uh, made the changes for one part of the country. He didn't uh, change the law in entire uh, entire country. He just uh, because uh, Yasmin mentioned also you mentioned before the political system. We have the national level, then we have two entity. We have two levels, and he changed. Uh, we he changed the uh, electoral law and he changed the constitution of federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's the Bosnian and Croats uh, federation, and he changes. Uh, we still don't know how will. Uh, how is he going to implement his de decisions? We also don't know the distributions of its upper uh, upper house of the of the parliament. Uh, before it was uh, counting fifty eight members. Now uh, he emerged uh, up to eighty. But we still don't know uh, the, the distributions of of those uh, uh, places in uh, upper house. Yesterday or two days ago, we have. Uh, 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 we have in some uh, media, we have, let's say, like hints, how, how will be these, uh, these uh, uh, places in, in upper house uh, distribute. And also the Bosniaks, who are the majority in, 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 in federation, uh, they, are, uh, they were strongly uh, against any changes of electoral law and uh, in the federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, in the last four years, we have constant uh, political crisis in between, uh, in between uh, Bosnia and Kras. Uh, we have a government uh, in technical, uh, technical mandate uh, for four years. So it's, uh, we, have the, we have the prime minister who was voted, who was elected, uh, who was appointed uh, eight years ago. And he's still because uh, uh, we have that, uh, that uh, political problem in between Bosnia and Kras. And now, the Bosnian politicians and uh, the or pro Bosnian politicians and political parties, uh, they are saying that uh, that uh, uh, these are decisions made by uh, 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 Christian Schmidt are made in favor of Croatia. Also, we have a statement of the Prime Minister of Republika uh, Croatia two days ago. He he said that these changes are for uh, effort of. Uh, lobbying of uh, Croatian government. That's uh, also uh, 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 interfering in internal affairs of, of another another country. Uh, also, Yasmin, a few days ago, he wrote uh, he wrote the status on, on Facebook. Uh, we have uh, its informal group of, of citizens. They are planning to organize riots uh, against uh, against uh, against these decisions. And uh, one of the organizers is a uh, uh, person who is running an organization called Anti Dayton Group. And now they are organizing, the Anti Dayton Group is organizing uh, a, a, a pro, pro, Dayton, pro Dayton protest. So it's, it's really, it's, and, and it's it also, Yasmin mentioned, uh, we still don't have official results. So we still don't know how is going to be implemented these uh, these changes or will they ever happen these change because the pro Bosnian politicians they are asking uh, from Christian Schmidt to withdraw his decision or to dismiss from the position of the of the high representative uh, and also some of the Bosnian politicians uh, they are telling that now the Bosnians should block uh, any decision in, in, in the parliament. So uh, it's really hard to, 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 to see the exit from this, this, this problem. And I think that the uh, decision that he made, uh, he made just one hour after the ballots are closed. So he devalued uh, democracy because he announced his decision making changes of of, of uh, electoral law just one hour, uh, hour after the, the uh, hour, one, hour, uh, after, uh, one hour after the uh, ballots are closed and 
uh, the message that he sends and then reads then to the people who are voting. What, why, why did we vote? If there is somebody who will just dismiss our will and he will, he will uh, 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 bring his own will because he, 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 he has authority uh, and he is, a, let's say, top authority in, in, in our country. And uh, I can't see the, the, the exit from this uh, uh, labyrinth. And I think that we will have a, 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 a continuing uh, political crisis in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, even though there is uh, uh, some rumors that he will change also the law, in, in the electoral law in, in, in the Republic of, of, of Serbia. Thank you for giving this insight. One of the events uh, followed by special media attention was the fight for the presidency of the Republic of Serbia entity. Former Serb members of the country's collective presidency, Milor Dodik, made a controversial campaign by using secessionist and pro Russia rhetoric. Accusations of Russian influence, rigged elections, arose, ending up in protests and vote recount. Mr. Karcic, Referring to the above allegations, we should also examine the role of foreign players in the country in general. In your opinion, do Russia, China, Turkey, the MENA countries, or other uh, countries with uh, big influence power, does they, do they influence Bosnian politics? Well, first of all, when you talk about foreign meddling and foreign influences in, in Bosnia, uh, we should not forget that interests coming from Serbia and Croatia are also foreign meddling inside Bosnia. And over the past uh, 30 years, we have seen constant meddling from Belgrade and from Zagreb, regardless of the political party that was in power. The, in Croatia, it was a brief period when, uh, when, uh, <clears throat> when Ivo Josipovic was in power, that we saw a, a very reconciliatory tone, tone towards Bosnia uh, as a country towards Bosnian, Bosnian Muslims as its majority population. However, over the, uh, over the last couple of years, the, the situation has um, deteriorated to such an extent uh, that it hasn't been this bad in years. For example, for, uh, from, uh, coming from Croatia, Croatia's president, incumbent president, Zoran Milanovic, is actually a social democrat. He comes from the, the Social Democratic Party, and he has, been, uh, he has gained notoriety for being extremely xenophobic and Islamophobic and for openly insulting uh, Bosnia as a country and its Bosnian Muslim population uh, uh, as, as a whole. Um, uh, uh, compared to, uh, and of course, this comes from a man who was supposed to be uh, coming, who was supposed to come from a liberal party. Uh, it makes it, uh, it drafts his opponents, uh, <coughs> Mr. Plenkovic's uh, Croatian uh, nationalist party, makes them look like, like a moderate political party in Croatia. Uh, on the side, in the case of Serbia, um, uh, Alexander Vucic um, and his uh, right hand man, Alexander Bulli, who is currently the Minister, uh, Minister of Interior, have been for quite some time flirting with the idea of creating the, the so called Serbian world, which is a copy paste of uh, Ruski, Ruski Mir, the Russian uh, world. And there has been constant meddling on the side of Serbia inside into Bosnia's internal affairs. Whoever is in power in Serbia openly supports the Republic of Srpska. They see the Republic of Srpska as the greatest wartime booty that um, Belgrade has achieved. And they would have constant interests inside Bosnia through the Republic of Srpska. For those of you younger students who may not be very familiar, the, the Republic of Srpska comprises 49% of the country. It's highly autonomous, it's a de facto state, with its own judiciary, uh, highly militarized police force, tax authority, parliament, administration, and so on and so forth. And of course, apart from, from uh, Croatian and Serbian meddling, uh, and of course, let's, let's not forget that both countries have irredentist aspirations toward Bosnia. They would like, in other words, they would like to see chunks of the country taken apart and joined towards neighboring Serbia and neighboring Croatia. Uh, and, and this is formulated in a different way. Coming from Croatia, they refer to it as a third entity. Coming, coming from Serbia, they call it the, the Serbian world. Um, then there is Russian meddling. Uh, Russia plays the spoiler role in the Balkans. It's a low cost way of meddling in somebody's internal affairs. They're not the big investor. Of course, the European Union is the biggest, most of the FDI comes from the, is more than 70% in Bosnia and the Western Balkans as a whole comes from the EU. Um, uh, Russia is not even among, among the ton, top 10 trade partners of Bosnia. However, Russia can rely on a number of proxies inside Bosnia to put brakes on the country's uh, 
EU and NATO accession. They can, they can use their man in the presidency, who is, who is still now a Milorad Dodik, but once he leaves office, his right-hand person, Zhejtar Tsvjanovic, comes into place, and while Dodik becomes the, the Republic of Srpska's president. So it's a Medvedev-Putin switch. He will still retain a lot of power over the country, which means that Moscow will, will retain a lot of power inside Bosnia. Um, then you have uh, new nationalist Serbian groups, such as the Srpska Chast, and the, and, the, and the Russian night wolves who operate freely in the Republic of Serbia and in Serbia. Then you have a lot of uh, pro-Russian businessmen, you have a lot of pro-Russian interests, and you have the Serbian Orthodox Church, which meddles into the affairs of Bosnia, Montenegro, and of course, Northern Kosovo. Um, so so of course, well, the question you may ask yourselves is, why would Russia be interested in a small country such as Bosnia in the Western Balkans, which has a lukewarm economy, which has a multi-layered Byzantine administration, which has, uh, which is not really a major power? Well, Russia wants to keep NATO. Um, let's put it this way: Russia wants to focus on its near abroad, on Ukraine, Belarus, and perhaps even Kazakhstan, because they have interests in, uh, in case a pro-Western government comes to power in uh, in Kazakhstan, they might be interested in, of course, taking part, taking Baikon or. Uh, back under their control. So they want to keep the West occupied in the Balkans. Um, and bear, bear in mind that Bosnia neighbors two NATO member states, Croatia and Montenegro. So it's very easy to spark a conflict inside Bosnia, and whatever happens in Bosnia will not stay in Bosnia. It has a spillover effect. During the last war, when, when, um, when Slobodan Milosevic attempted to create a greater Serbia by taking away chunks of Croatia, Bosnia, uh, and Kosovo, uh, the entire region was inflamed. And this idea, this, so despite Slobodan Milosevic not being in power anymore, the idea lives on. So in, in Serbia, no matter if you're there, uh, I mean, as I travel to Belgrade quite often, I speak to activists, to intellectuals, to politicians and opposition politicians. They, are, they, may, have, they may be critical towards Alexander Vucic, but as far as their national interests are concerned, they are on the same page. They, uh, they do not, most of them do not recognize Kosovo's independence. Most of them see, uh, would support the Republic of Srpska's independence, or at least would, would like to keep it as it is, highly, highly autonomous. They would support meddling into the Bosnia's internal affairs. They do not recognize that the genocide committed in Srebrenica. <coughs> of course, um, uh, they, would like, they would like to keep Bosnia and the, and the region outside of, of NATO and to a certain extent outside of the, of the EU. So, um, and then in the Kremlin's mindset, uh, there's a tit for tat moment because the NATO began expanding eastwards and infringing upon uh, what Russia considers its own zone of quote unquote zone of influence. They want to hit back at NATO in the West and of course keep them busy in the Balkans by meddling in the internal affairs of Montenegro, as we saw last year during the, the case of the Serbian uh, and Montenegrin Orthodox Church and the mass protests, in the case of Bosnia and the case of Kosovo. Um, so this will continue for quite some time. As far as Turkey is concerned, I've, I've been dealing with Turkey for, for a very long time. I do believe that Turkey's influence has been exaggerated, you know. Every time we talk about Turkey's influence in the Balkans, uh, most Western observers will say that Turkey uh, that Turkey is a uh, defender of Bosnian Muslims. This is entirely wrong. Uh, there were close relations between the Bakiris and Begovic, uh, who, was until, who was early a member of the, uh, the tripartite presidency, and who still heads the most powerful Bosnian <laughs> political party, and between uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. However, these were personal relations. Bakiris and Begovic and, his, and the SDA is a highly corrupt and very inefficient political party. He's no longer uh, there. They no longer have a member of the presidency. Bosnian Muslims voted for uh, a liberal, Denis Bejevic, who comes from the, the Social Democratic Party. While, uh, while, uh, so this might provide some challenges in the future to Turkey's interests uh, in the Balkans. However, if you look at um, bilateral trade, uh, direct FDI in the region, uh, Turkey has uh, in the Western Balkans. It's uh, it's Serbia's biggest trade partner. Um, so, um, if you look at the number of companies established, there are 400 uh, Turkish-owned companies established in Serbia. Do you know how many there are in Bosnia? 36. And all the time when we read these four and different analysis coming from abroad, we hear about how Recep Tayyip Erdogan is, uh, you know, is a close friend of Bosnia because they are Muslims. Religion, is, in this case Islam, plays no role whatsoever in Turkey's foreign policy. Turkey's foreign policy is extremely pragmatic, and it is extremely, it is business oriented, you know. Turkey will not invest in your country because you're a Muslim. They don't give a damn if you are a Muslim. They will invest in your country if their profits can 
and large. Hence, they invest in Serbia because Serbia is a highly centralized state and because they are very open, open to doing business. Uh, in the case of Bosnia, it's multi-layered uh, administration makes it far more complex for any, any serious investments. Um, so uh, so uh, going back to our, to our, uh, to our question, um, but nothing concrete will change in Bosnia following these elections. Um, um, what, however, what changed following Russia's invasion of Ukraine is that uh, this no longer is a security uh, political situation. This is an uh, alarm, a, a, a very seriously deteriorating security situation. Uh, so bad was the situation back in January this year that some of my friends who work in the international work in, the, uh, in international organizations began began withdrawing their foreign cash reserves from banks because they thought that a war was going to break out. It was so serious back in January that the U.S. embassy in Sarajevo carried out a military exercise on on evacuating its staff from the Bosnian uh, from its embassy in Sarajevo. So um, because uh, had Kiev fallen. Bosnia would already be at war. I'm so sure that had Kiev fallen, Dodik would have declared independence, Bosnian Muslims would have proposed it, we would be at war. However, because Kiev is fighting back so bravely, because of the strong, extremely strong Western support towards uh, President Zelensky and the Ukrainian military, Milan Dodik received a very clear message and backed down. He made, he made this very clear himself. He said, and I quote, he said, we have delayed our secession plans because of the, the war in Ukraine. So he was very, very, uh, I, I believe he was very close to achieving his goal. However, because of the very strong response from the West, he backed down, although he has not given up on his, on his idea yet. The only way to secure Bosnia's uh, uh, territorial integrity and to safeguard Balkan security as a whole is not to rely on the European Union as you for peacekeeping mission. I do not trust them. They barely have a thousand soldiers. They cannot keep the peace. International assessments by high-ranking security officials say that you need to have at least a, a 5,000 uh, troop member if not, uh, presence in the country to maintain the peace. What we need at this moment is either A, NATO fast-tracking Bosnia to join the alliance, or B, NATO beefing, very seriously beefing up its military presence uh, in the country. NATO can do so because it outsourced its peacekeeping mission to the U to U4 in 2004, which was a major mistake. They should go back to keeping the peace uh, in the country. Bear in mind, in 1996, uh, NATO, its mission S4, had 60,000 mostly American troops in Bosnia. Now they only have a, a couple of hundred. Uh, the U4 mission is about 1,200. Um, uh, so uh, if you want to keep the peace in Bosnia and the Balkans, NATO needs to beef up its, its presence. We see a very serious U.S. comeback to the region. I'm not sure if this will happen, as Sada earlier said. NATO is now uh, most, more focused on, 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 um, on, U on, on arming Ukraine. U.S. as a whole is shifting its presence to the Asia-Pacific region. The, uh, even back when Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State, she said that the U.S. was going to shift 60% of its uh, naval of its true presence to the Asia Pacific region. So I do not think the Balkans is of a priority, but it should be a priority because whatever happens in Bosnia will not stay in Bosnia. It has it will most likely have a spillover effect in the rest of the region. Thank you very much for revealing these connections. Uh, as a last question, we have to focus on uh, the uniform government uh, as it would determine the future of Bosnia. What are the main challenges uh, that the upcoming Botiatic government must face with and how can it reach its national goals as far as internal and external affairs are considered? And uh, this because I kindly invite you to ask for discussion briefly as we are running out of time. Okay, may I first? So, two maybe problems that I see. First, when you mentioned national goals, we don't have national goals as a country because even our uh, public opinion, our Publicity, it's not one publicity, it's always divided with three. So what is a national goal for the main Serbian third parties is in fact that what is the national goal of the bordering Serbia. It's the same with, with Croats and Croatia. And then you have uh, Bosniaks and those who don't want to get connected with any kind of, of, of ethnicity. That would be a small amount of people that would probably have uh, something like national goals, but they would be opposite because uh, that would, would, would be considered as a national goal for those who are claiming that our Bosnians would not 
be the same as those national goals from, from the dominant Bosnian politics. Um, the second thing is that I'm very skeptical what will happen um, uh, regarding the new or old government, because uh, first, our political parties have no programs and no ideology at all. Everything is mostly ethically based. And if we see right now, okay, the tripartite presidency made some kind of changes because it's the, for the first time that the Bosniaks voted for a left liberal member of the presidency. Uh, but in fact, that's the only that's the only change because in the, on the parliament level, on the state level, uh, the main political actors remain the, the three predominantly ethnical, ethnical political parties. Now, the problem is that there is an idea to uh, somehow avoid making coalition with the national parties. And that would lead to a very strange and weak coalition between very different political parties that don't share any goal. They main, they main goal is to avoid SDA currently and probably to avoid SNSD or HDZ. And then you will have a very weak coalition with no, 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 no unifying goal at all. So the problem is revanchism. Even while why uh, Bakis and Begovic lost the elections was revanchism because many members of SDA don't want to vote for him and shifted the votes towards Jelko Komšić. And Jelko Komšić has already been accused by Croats that he is not a legitimate uh, Croat member of the presidency because Croats were overvoted by Bosniaks. And then still the tension is, is there. Uh, I also would be very skeptical about European Union, not because I'm Eurosceptical, but because uh, there is no consensus inside the European Union regarding further integration. Just look at the Eurobarometer uh, surveys. You will see a strong difference between new member states and old member states. And those new member states are mostly those that are very illiberal political regimes. So if you don't have a common goal, um, it's very questionable if there will be any kind of further enlargement. And I think that the, everything that is European Union telling us about the EU future of the Balkans is just something that they want to maintain uh, symbolical power and currently they're using it to, I don't know, to threaten Russia or to, to see as Europe has some kind of future. Uh, but what we saw in the previous years was something that in political theory is called stabilocracy. Uh, you have, uh, so the European Union is backing up local authoritarian uh, politicians and political leaders in the Balkans for securing peace and stability. So they are rewarding, in fact, uh, very uh, authoritarian political practices for maintaining peace. Uh, and the politicians are using everything that comes from the European Union uh, just to hide that they don't have any common political vision of how to achieve something. Even today, we uh, didn't manage to, to fulfill any of 14 criteria the European Union gave us a couple of years ago. Now we have the enlargement package that was, uh, I think, announced a week ago. Uh, making eight more steps, but it's very questionable that it will remain um, or be a political priority. And even a weak central government cannot discuss about, about important, let's say, national issues. Those sovereign powers are on uh, lower authorities. So it's the, the multi-level governance is just making it uh, even, even more complex. So I don't see any 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 bigger change there. So, so yeah, I want uh, Yasmin explained everything uh, 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 really nice, and I will agree with most of of, of uh, those that he shared with us. And uh, also, what we have a problem. He, he mentioned the uh, trying to avoid the SDA, which is the still 
the most powerful political party in Bosnia and Herzegovina. They uh, they won most uh, most uh, votes in, in in almost each level of of of, uh, of government and. Uh, we have a problem because our political system is that we have two uh, two houses of parliament, and uh, the SDA will remain in control if they avoid them on the on the lower lower house. Uh, the SDA will control the uh, the upper house of of uh, state level or, or or the federal federal level, and uh, it is really really hard. Uh, it is really hard to to avoid that that political party. They want more than two hundred thousand. Votes on these these uh, uh, these these elections, and we, we are facing with, with all these these problems. Like like uh, uh, Yasmin mentioned, uh, there is no national goal. Uh, uh, we still uh, we are uh, we are uh, spending let's say uh, two years to 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 assemble the, the government. The the recent uh, the recent uh, council of of ministry. Uh, they cancelled five five uh, 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 meetings in a row, uh, and they they can't agree on any any questions. And it's really 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 hard to 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 understand the the the, the position uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, are we going to NATO? Are we going to EU? These are the, it should be the, the the main national goals, but. Unfortunately, we have the force, political forces in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, like uh, 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 Republika Srpska, they are strongly against uh, uh, any uh, Euro uh, Euro Atlantic integration. And and also what uh, uh, Harold mentioned, Amir uh, Milor Dodik and and Alexander Vučić uh, and the beginning of the Russian aggression against against uh, against Ukraine. Uh, if you if you watching the media in Serbia and Republika Srpska, you can notice that uh, Milorad uh, Dodik and Aleksandar Vucic for first few days of the invasion, they were, you know, turn off. They, they are totally quiet because they're waiting what will happen in, 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 in Ukraine. And everyone thought also in Europe, in the world, that uh, the Kiev will fall in, in 96 hours. And also, I was sure that they will try to do something either in Kosovo or in Bosnia and Herzegovina or in both these, 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 these parts. And these are all the problems that we are, we are facing in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, 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 I'm, I'm not sure what will look like and what kind of government we will have. I think I'm the opinion that we will just continue with the with government that we have uh, in, in, in past four years. Um, well, I, I don't know if I, most of my colleagues have uh, pretty much said everything that there should be added. I would also like to just, since we are in Budapest, just to uh, touch upon uh, Prime Minister Orban's links with, uh, with Milorad Dodik. Uh, Milorad Dodik has been trying hard to cozy up to Prime Minister Orban in the last couple of years. And he has been presenting this, I mean, he's been using it for domestic consumption to show himself as having very extensive links uh, abroad and having support abroad. Um, I think the mistake made by Bosnian Muslim and uh, Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian uh, Bosnian Croat politicians is uh, their their um, is because is that they haven't yet reached out to to Prime Minister Orban. They have paid no official visits to Budapest. I think that uh, if they want to um, reduce Milorad Dodik's influence on Prime Minister Orban to um, you know, to prevent him from having a monopoly on these relations between Bosnia and, uh, and Hungary, uh, the Bosniak and Croat members of the presidency should uh, uh, should take this more seriously and pay more official visits to the country to make sure that uh, relations are held at, at the state level and that individual members of the presidency cannot promote promote their own uh, secessionist agenda to other neighboring countries, countries that are members of the EU and the NATO. Now, I don't think there's any bad will on the side of Prime Minister Orban or the Hungarian state as a whole. I think it could only be, only be a matter of them not, not having adequate, correct, and balanced information coming from Bosnia, but having instead only one-sided information coming from uh, from Milorad Dodik. Uh, this should be should be changed. Uh, they should work on this in the future. This is, of course, criticism uh, uh, directed towards Bosnia and Croat 
uh, politicians uh, as members of the presidency. Um, will anything change after elections? I do not think so. I mean, look at the second runner up to the presidency of the Republic of Serbia, Jelena Trivic. Um, she was considered an opposition figure, opposition to Dodik. Uh, but when you speak to her, uh, when in the interviews that she gave, uh, her position is pretty much the same. She said, we, we will coordinate our foreign policy with that of Belgrade. So here we have a, mem uh, a, a high rank, uh, a rising star among the Republic of Srpska's politicians, an opposition to Dodik, um, who pretty much repeats the same talking points as Milward Dodik. So essentially in the future, whoever comes to power, nothing will change uh, because they're in, in, within the, those who are in power and in, in opposition to the Republic of Srpska, um, they're pretty much on the same page as far as their own national interests are concerned. <laughs> There are no questions. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the uh, our uh, distinguished guests that uh, they accepted our invitation and uh, that we have got uh, such a fruitful and valuable discussion today. And I also would like to thank uh, the attention of the audience and uh, encourage you to participate in the next lecture about Bulgaria. So, dear guests, last but not least, we we are having our third panel about Bulgarian politics in the shadow of the war in Ukraine and the general elections in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There, there were uh, another occasion, a very important one event. It happened in Bulgaria uh, on the 2nd of October. There were uh, <laughs> snap elections, parliamentary elections. In 18 months, the fourth one. So there were uh, uh, four consecutive uh, parliamentary elections. Three of them were um, um, earlier ballots, and uh, it gives a special emphasis to our topic now. Let me just very briefly introduce our uh, guest expert. We have the privilege to host Ms. Nadia Kirilova, a research fellow from the European Security and Defense College and the Corvinus University of Budapest. And uh, we have Dr. Maria Sabrev, who serves as a security policy analyst at the Sofia Bay Center for the Study of Democracy. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. So, my name is uh, Balin Tod. I serve as a researching lecturer at the Center for Political Science at Matthias Corvinus Collegium. Last November, there were uh, early parliamentary elections in Bulgaria. And uh, those elections were won by a newly formed party led by Kirill Petkov and uh, Asim Vasilev. Both of them graduated at the Harvard University, Business University. And uh, so they had a surprise victory with, with their party. We continue to change PP with 25% uh, of the vote. They formed a government a coalition government with other parties, the Bulgarian Socialist Party, uh, the Democratic Bulgaria, and the very such a nation, there is such a people, ITN of uh, Singer and Republic. <laughs> but in half a year and six months or so, seven, seven months, uh, this government uh, was ousted by a no confidence vote, uh, which was um, an action from the side of the side of the most important uh, opposition, right-wing opposition parties, the GER, led by former Prime Minister Boyko Borisov, and backed by uh, the uh, far-right um, was Rajdane party, and uh, also by a former coalition partner, ITA. So that's why you had elections again in on the 2nd of October. So, Nelly, would you please just uh, describe us the very complicated circumstances of and the motives behind this constant political and governmental crisis uh, in Bulgaria that started back in the summer of 2020? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, also for the question. Um, as we heard in the previous panels, there are problems in the Balkans that the governments are never changing. Well, in Bulgaria, we don't have this problem anymore. <laughs> the country used to be considered a Balkan country in the past. Now it is considered a new country. It is also a Black Sea regional country. So it has characteristics of all sides, also Balkan ones. 
Um, now uh, we have changing governments, <laughs> constantly changing, and this is considered a good um, thing that happens in the country. It is a result of uh, more than 12 years lasting uh, governance of the GAP party on the visible side and on the hidden and visible side. It was supported by the DPSD or the, the pro-Turkish party. Uh, protests started in 2019 because the corruption um, reached a too high level and uh, it was unbearable for the population to continue this way. There were a lot of uh, problems that I'm not going to go into deep to explain them, but uh, after the protests, um, GERB was uh, about to fall. And at that time, COVID happened, a lot of people <laughs> went back to the country. So we also didn't have the brain gain, brain uh, drain problem anymore. We had the brain gain. But dur during COVID, the protests were forbidden and there were very strict restrictions and everybody was staying at home. So no protests at all. Uh, however, due to the protests and the unrest, there were a lot of new parties formed and we had changing uh, elections time after time and the, um, this process continues even until now we had the new elected uh, deputies but uh, we still don't have a head of the uh, national assembly so maybe we will have another swift elections in three years which is actually good uh, marian would you be that kind to provide the, an insight um, to the police policies and decisions and initiatives of the former, so outgoing government that was uh, primarily led by, initially led by Kirill Petkov. And, you know, they promised uh, media reform, uh, judicial reforms. They had an anti-corruption agenda. So what happened? Did they... Actually, the two strongest points that the uh, former coalition government had were judicial reform and anti-corruption, like new anti-corruption legislation. Um, both of which happens to a certain extent. Um, most the judicial reform most uh, <clears throat> um, surrounded the um, decision of the um, prosecutor in chief. So um, in Bulgaria, the judiciary separates in three prosecutor, judges, and uh, investigators. Um, so the institute of the uh, um, Supreme Prosecutor or Prosecutor in Chief is uh, an old concept that wasn't really um, dealt with when our newest constitution was uh, um, uh, was written. So it was a leftover regime uh, from Soviet times. Thus, it is highly hierarchical. It uh, follows uh, a really um, well. It is a model open to influences within it. Uh, which uh, naturally leads to uh, vulnerabilities within the, within the system. So uh, one of the biggest um, reasons for the process that uh, my colleague mentioned, um, the pro protests on the streets, um, was the fact that the uh, uh, prosecutor in chief um, walked into the uh, building of the administration of the president um, a couple of months uh, before the end of term of uh, last uh, work recent government and arrested a couple of uh, his advisors, of the president's advisors, which um, of course was uh, seen as an attack on the uh, separation of powers, rule of law, and so on. This was really the tipping point that uh, brought people uh, to the streets, uh, I mean, in the tens of thousands. Um, this coupled with the uh, endemic corruption, I would say, uh, were the two, the two main uh, the pivot points for um, well, just people getting getting rid of Gareth uh, uh, and uh, the government. So what uh, the coalition government did was first go for judicial reform um, to uh, remove some of the powers of the uh, Prosecutor General. Um, there, there was another issue uh, which we got the specialized uh, judiciary, uh, which uh, was uh, created by the first Bristol government, um, but Bristol uh, led three governments in the course of, of 
uh, years. So the first Bristol government uh, created a um, kind of a dual system of uh, justice, uh, which uh, instead of uh, bringing uh, more justice, uh, brought about more vulnerabilities. And um, um, it led to an even more um, deeply captured uh, judiciary. So this was removed. So this was one of the probably the biggest accomplishment of the, uh, of the government. And the second one uh, was that uh, they managed to uh, come up with a, an entirely new um, anti-corruption uh, legislation. Um, I had the honor to be a part of the working group on uh, one of the two uh, proposals that were put forward. Um, even though it didn't have the technical time to uh, be passed uh, for the parliament because uh, it was solved uh, before uh, the term was up. Uh, <laughs> we had uh, the opportunity to discuss publicly uh, in an open forum with all political parties, uh, with, uh, we heard uh, the opinion of uh, constitutionalists of uh, all interest parties. So there was uh, the beginning of this public dialogue on how Bulgarian anti-corruption policy should look like. Um, so I, I believe that this is the second biggest uh, half of achievement of uh, the uh, latest uh, government. I understand it must be very difficult uh, to lead a government of uh, four parties and then three parties with very diverse ideologies mm -hmm. and very different and sometimes antagonistic aims as far as foreign or interior policies are, are um, considered. Nelly mentioned that Bulgaria is an important player, not just on the Balkans, but in the Black Sea region. And uh, let me address the last question to both of you. So, in the shadow of the war in Ukraine, in the middle of a, or maybe in the beginning of a huge global energy, energy crisis and high inflation, and uh, you know, waiting and stepping on the threshold to get into the eurozone. How a weak government could lead a, a country. So, what do you think? What will be the most important task or the most important tasks of the uh, upcoming government in Bulgaria? Task number one: to cope with the cold winter, because winter is cold and we need energy. We need also enough resources of the people to pay for the lights, for the um, electricity, for the food, and the prices are extremely high at the moment compared to the salaries. But the second uh, very important thing is to secure the country in its uh, defense, because even uh, these days the president who is the military, he comes from the Air Force, he was uh, reminding the people that we need to uh, secure our skies and we need to, to order even new aircraft. We need to be a um, strong member of NATO and the European Union, yes, but we also need to have our own um, security. And part of the security is not only the military security, it is the energy security, the food security, the security of information which is exchanged between the people, and also the security of water. I forgot to mention that we have protests because of the water crisis in Bulgaria. It concerned several cities because the reconstruction of them was, uh, I would say, Correct. <laughs> and a lot of people didn't have water for nine or more months. This sounds maybe not uh, uh, very shiny in the first moment, but actually water is very important and people without drinking water and people without water for um, uh, having showers and having the normal uh, hygiene in their houses is a huge problem and it enlarges the epidemic. So uh, water is a big issue and the government should provide water, food, uh, energy, just the basics from the pyramid of Maslow. This is the first thing. And it should look from outside and stable uh, player. At the moment, Bulgaria is uh, not uh, looking at a stable player in the region, and it should 
um, improvement. And this is why there was a lot of space for the new parties to appear because they were saying, yes, we are in NATO and in the EU, and we very strongly support this position, which is basically the general position of the country, but it should not uh, forget its neighbors. And its neighbors are Turkey, Russia, Balkans, and we should be aware of the situation. So we need experts on all fields concerning internal security and external security first. Thank you. I agree with my colleague that situational awareness uh, is, is key uh, in the year 2022. Um, but um, I'm a bit more optimistic, I think. Um, we'll most surely cope with the winter. Um, we have our gas uh, storage already at uh, 83% as of today. Hopefully, by end of month, it will be 90%, which will allow us. Uh, to, to have a uh, winter warm enough. Uh, our uh, uh, supply diversification is already secured. Um, the power mix uh, diversity is, I think, the best level it has ever been. Um, so in terms of energy security, I, I believe that Bulgaria is in a um, good stance. Uh, Italy and Germany should be more worried about uh, theirs. Uh, for sure. But for me, it's uh, the first issue of parliament and of government should be uh, making a clear stance on our values, where we stand in the world. Because, um, and it was mentioned in, 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 uh, in the previous panels, um, in times of peace, we can allow uh, ourselves to, to, to be in the middle trying to play both sides, trying to sit on both chairs. Uh, we're all bit past that. And uh, like it or not, <laughs> we, we chosen sides uh, in uh, uh, 1997 when we uh, signed our um, um, the accession process to the EU and, and NATO. And uh, we should be very clear on this to our partners. Um, which will give us the grounds to uh, secure um, better equipped armed forces um, and, um, uh, and and security uh, altogether. And with, with regards to the arms forces, it, it's it's really important to know that Bulgaria is a really uh, <laughs> militarily incapable um, country. The um, only um, way that we can secure uh, our territorial integrity, our sovereignty, is through collective defense, which is through NATO. And this is clear to everyone, including uh, the uh, commander in chief, uh, president. Um, and uh, playing with fire on his behalf uh, in, uh, at the time when uh, there is no government, and we should not forget that we are a parliamentary republic, not a presidential. Um, doesn't uh, doesn't uh, secure a better future uh, for them. I see. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. I would like to react. Sure, um, well, I'll make a link with the previous panels because uh, some of our colleagues um, mentioned things that the, the EU maybe doesn't want the Balkans, or maybe now is not the time, or maybe the, the responsibility is external. Yes, all of the time the Balkans. Bulgaria in the past, and also I hear it from you, uh, we're trying to bring the responsibility to, to external players. So this could be the EU, Russia, NATO, or somebody else who is outside of our space. Well, my colleague also is doing this uh, in what I heard, that uh, Bulgaria is part of collective defense um, uh, union, so it is expecting that the defense will come from outside. Well, actually, no, this is transforming nowadays, and uh, the responsibility is ours. The responsibility is in our politicians, in our everyday choices, that we bring the security to our countries, and that we bring the political stability to our countries. So the EU does want to accept the Western Balkans, but the Western Balkans should take the responsibility to respect the values that the EU promotes. This is what is um, the core issue that we are trying to focus. And this mentality of uh, bringing the responsibility to somebody else comes, comes from the past, from before 89. 
Nowadays, it is our responsibility how we will manage our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was a perfect uh, concluding remark from your side to, to end our event. And uh, also, we were very smart because uh, we were the only panel to make it in time to finish. <laughs> so, yes, we are the winners. Sorry, guys, from Bosnia and the online team. Uh, I give the floor to the audience. Do we have questions? We have one. Please. Uh, just a, a very interesting panel on hearing what you speak. Uh, just a quick question about uh, Bulgaria's uh, energy security. Uh, there were recently plans, uh, I believe it has been already inked, uh, for Bulgaria to receive its gas supplies from Azerbaijan across the Tana pipeline. And uh, Serbia recently signed, Alexander uh, Vucic signed an agreement to create another shorter pipeline connecting Bulgaria to Serbia, right? So this would in, in effectively bring Azeri gas towards Serbia and Middle East Bosnia. Uh, percentage wise, uh, where does your gas? This open to both of you. Mm. Where do your gas? Where does your gas come from? And how quickly can you switch to to other gas? And if, if your plan is not to be dependent entirely on Russian gas, uh, our gas comes from Turkey, and that's the answer. So you do, you don't care where Turkey no, gets it? No, no, I do care, but Turkey uh, has uh, has gotten into a role of a middle there. Okay. Turkey buys gas and then sells it. It doesn't trans gas. So this uh, means that our estimations show that 62 to 65% of the gas that we're getting are from Azerbaijan. Then there is some from the Middle East. And of course, there is a part in, within the mix that is coming from Russia. According to the numbers that we're getting uh, on the uh, uh, deals that Turkey is making with other countries, we can never know. Gas is gas, and they mix it, and they put it on the pipe. With regards to the pipe to, uh, to, to Serbia, it's actually not a new thing. It's part of uh, the so-called uh, Balkan uh, pipeline, or it's Putin's pipeline. Uh, it's, uh, it was just about time to uh, get to this part of the, of the trace. Uh, what is going to actually happen, uh, we really don't know. This, this means uh, a huge public procurement. Uh, procedure, it will take time, and um, I I don't see it happening before the end of the conflict because uh, because of the whole geopolitical uh, risks involved. Yeah, please. Again, we have different views here. According to my information, Bulgaria was until recently dependent on Russian gas more than eighty nine percent. And Three months ago. Uh, yes. And actually, uh, Bulgaria was um, uh, having supplies from Azeri gas since a couple of years ago. And also, Bulgaria produces electricity and exports it. So it could limit the exports and uh, use more of its own electricity, which was one of the arguments of Kirill Petkov. But he was just saying it. I don't know whether he succeeded to implement it. And also, in the past, there were nuclear plants in Bulgaria that were started. It was a Russian project, but it was alternative source of um, energy supplies. It was stopped, but we never know. Maybe in the future it could revive. And finally, the bacteria in the Bexley region, which produces gas, and uh, there could be uh, more research on this, and we could use it for purposes of the uh, Just a short reaction. Um, our primary electricity source is nuclear. Now we're buying from French, no longer from the Russians. We're getting uh, the uh, uh, two buys uh, from uh, General Electric, which is a new deal, where Siemens also had the deal, um, a deal, totally different thing. Uh, very uh, Gas is, is not really relevant to the Bulgarian economy. It's just uh, public speaking. There are businesses still who are using gas, but they're trying to, trying to adapt. What we uh, really uh, are looking for is uh, how to uh, secure heating in our biggest, uh, um, our biggest uh, uh, cities, which is really the, uh, the issue. But again, um, obviously this year we'll rely mostly on electricity rather than public heating. And uh, with regards to uh, the opportunities we deal with the Black Sea, um, it is our belief and um, our research over the past uh, year and a half shows that 
um, going for, um, well, fostering and employing the uh, <coughs> energy capacity in the Black Sea region, particularly in the uh, shared um, uh, continental shelf with uh, Romania, is uh, going to bring uh, much more uh, value to, to the country rather than uh, renewing uh, projects of 10 years old, which were just blocked uh, due to a variety of reasons, again, linked to uh, corrupt uh, government at the time. You're speaking about the shield, yes? No, no, no. no. Okay. No, uh, uh, winds, wind turbines, yeah, we, um, I, I can sh uh, share some research with you um, after, the, after the talk. And last problem that we had with the Republic of North Macedonia, we, uh, our political parties don't agree which is the correct strategy towards the Republic of North Macedonia, but it could be a subject of another discussion. What is your opinion? I have one question. Both of you uh, spoke about uh, security threat to Bulgaria and the increasing of arms for reason for increasing. And who do you see as a major uh, security threat uh, in Bulgaria? Great. Yes, so which so NATO member? Yeah, what do you think? No. So you were speaking about security threat to Bulgaria and the reason that you have to increase the arms force. And who do you see as a major threat to Bulgaria? We have a lot, but uh, um, let's um, decompose security. Security is not only military security. I, I, I was asking only about military security because uh, you mentioned that your president, you want to expand the uh, air forces and everything. So who do you see as a military threat to, to, to the whole? I wouldn't say that we have actually a military security threat at the moment, apart from okay, there is a war very close to us and we should be prepared just in case. But indeed, we are threatened on the security in different parts of the security, and we should really decompose the term of security in a lot of different topics: economic, energy security, and military security, political and diplomatic, people, social security, governmental security, information and exchange of information security. Which I do in my dissertation. Two days ago, our uh, entire government uh, and uh, strategic infrastructure, um, and also the infrastructure of a couple of other organizations, including mine, were attacked by and still being attacked by uh, persistent threats uh, from Russia and Kazakhstan. Um, this brought down uh, the service for about two hours, uh, ranging between the institutions. Um, it was uh, uh, the attack was committed by a, a Kremlin-linked group uh, named QNET. Uh, they actually announced the attack on Friday evening, a whole day before they uh, they uh, committed it. So there was actually some time for preparation. Um, but it is it is evident uh, where the military security and also information security risk comes from. Uh, we remember uh, to a, uh, a collective defense coalition. Um, so it is it is obvious which uh, sides of the um, fight line we stand. You want to say Russia, I would, to, would like to say it's not only Russia, but also Turkey, because you're asking this, I guess. Uh, in the panel on Bosnia, you mentioned that Turkey is investing in the country for just economic reasons. But if you read the foreign policy of Turkey, foreign policy strategy, you'll see that a huge part of it is uh, focused on the population outside of Turkey, which is either Turkish speaking or Muslim. So this is a way for Turkey to access the internal situation in the country, in Bosnia, in Bulgaria, in other countries, and to influence it through different channels. But it is not only done by Turkey and Russia, it is done by each regional power, and it is not anything new. It's happening repeatedly in history and in different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Now, I'm uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I suggest continuing this uh, very thought-provoking and, and uh, interesting discussion the same way as Kyrgyz Petkov is continuing the change with, with his party. Uh, thank you very much for coming to our, to our workshop. Our